Hello, I'm W.T. Edmondson, and welcome to Focus. Freedom often causes unbelievable silence. The aim of Focus, of course, is to educate, motivate, and increase public awareness relative to public issues, uh, politics, social justice issues. We recently introduced a uh, business focus segment for our program, and the primary purpose of uh, business focus is to uh, bring entrepreneurs uh, to the stage uh, to basically talk about uh, their venture, uh, how they happen to come up with the concept of the idea, and then how do they move that uh, concept from concept to reality. So we've had a few uh, entrepreneurs on and we uh, hope to have more. So if there's anyone out there who are entrepreneurs and uh, wish to come on to the program to talk about uh, what you're doing, uh, please contact us and we'll be more than happy to get you on. Our spotlight entrepreneur today is Amir Smith. He is a licensed cosmetologist, songwriter, singer, and vocal producer. Mr. Smith has uh, been blessed to have been invited to California, namely Hollywood in particular, on numerous occasions and is the recipient of various awards, primarily in the gospel category. His debut album was entitled Color Me 2012. He also uh, had the privilege of singing with Stevie Wonder, he shared with me. We have a clip uh, that we will uh, share with you right now, and we'll come back and we will talk to Mr. Smith. My name is Amir Smith. I'm nominated with The Front Line, and we're nominated for the Contemporary Christian category tonight. That's incredible. What does it mean to you being a contemporary Christian artist to be nominated for an award at the HMMAs? Um, it's an awesome opportunity. It's an award uh, ceremony, and I'm, I'm glad to see Smokey Robinson getting the Lifetime Achievement Award tonight. So to be in that company means a lot to us. Have you had a chance to um, introduce yourself to Smokey yet? No, I haven't. Not yet, but I'm looking forward to that tonight. <laughs> we got to meet him before, an incredible guy, and it's yeah, going to be so he's cool an awesome now. man. He's an awesome man. I have to compliment you as well on this this getup. The vest and the blue shirt, that's oh, awesome. Man, I, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. I have, I have almost, it doesn't look as good on me, but I have almost the same thing in my closet. So that's yeah, cool. well, it looks good on my skin, so I'm happy. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations on your nomination, and good luck tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome back. We hope that you enjoyed that clip. Um, as I indicated, our guest is Mr. Amir Smith, and uh, we're going to basically talk to him a little bit about, get to know him a little bit, and then we will go into the gist of the interview. Uh, welcome to Focus. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Um, everyone has a story, uh, and I see that uh, you have quite a story. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you happen to come to Jefferson City and eventually to Columbia? Uh, my journey in Jefferson City goes back to the early 90s. I was a kid, uh, got here right around eighth, ninth grade finished high school here. I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and my father was living here, and so we came to be with my father at that age. I was about 14 or so, and finished high school here, uh, began serving the Lord at a local church in Columbia, and met my wife. Uh, we got married in 2000, and so I was a background singer at the church for about 11 years or so, and served faithfully, did that, loved it, um, it wasn't until around 2007, 2008 that my pastors actually looked at me and came to me and asked if I would become the church's new worship leader. And so that's the beginning, I would say, of the journey into music full time like that. And so, yeah. Okay. Um, Barbara Cosmetologist. Yeah. Singer. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how did you happen to get into Barbara's Oh man, I've been cutting hair since I was 13. So, I mean, my dad always cut hair as I was growing up and I always watched him. I don't remember him being very hands-on showing me things, but just through the advent of watching, I'm a, I'm a seeing person. If I can see you do it, I probably can pick it up. Mm -hmm. And so a uh, visual person and uh, he started cutting, well, he was cutting it. So I started picking the tools up and started using them and got better. And all of my friends in high school started wanting me to cut their hair and then Next thing you know, I was getting invited by the barbers around town to come and talk and interview, and uh, one thing led to another. 
2004, I decided to go ahead and get my license. I had worked for the state up to that point, uh, for the state of Missouri up to that point for about 11 years, 10 mm -hmm. years, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so um, how did you decide to venture into cosmetology? Um, it was kind of a natural thing. I mean, I always wanted to know everything. In, in, in anything that you do, I feel it's important. If you're going to do it, do it wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. And so instead of just getting the barber, I decided to go ahead and get the cosmetologist licensed and so that I would have the full um, arsenal. And so mm -hmm. I could take care of women, men, boys, girls, mm -hmm. all ages, and I do that today. And so I still love doing it. And okay. so it's always been natural for me, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Where did the love for music come from? Oh, man. I would say probably from birth. I mean, my mom and my dad put instilled a great passion and love for music, all kinds of music. And so even around the house, you know, uh, I'm, I'm from the, the album era, you know, we're playing albums and record players and my mom would, uh, you know, she chasing me, don't scratch my albums, you know? So I was always very meticulous and very careful. And even they would use music to put me to sleep at a certain age, before five, you know, because I wouldn't go to sleep at night. <laughs> Music's just always been a part of my life, and so, yeah. Um, so you are an elder at your church, you're a licensed mm -hmm. minister, uh, you're a senior worship leader uh, at Ladder House Kingdom Ministries in Columbia. Yeah. Um, how has your association with the church led you to this stage of your life? It's been everything for me. Um, I can't speak on anyone else's journey, but me serving the Lord has really opened up doors, not just for myself, but I'm now finding doors are opening for my kids, the way that I see uh, how I'm raising them and the opportunities I want them to have stem from, I say, my history within the church. And so I'm, I'm just so glad that I made that option at about the age of 19 to really begin to serve the Lord in that way. And through the advent of time, you know, just serving on a team and being faithful at that and then being asked to become a leader on the team. And then being faithful in that has opened up doors for us to begin to record and then even getting looks from outside influences such as California. Mm -hmm. And so that it's been a gradual process. It, it really wasn't one thing. It really was just kind of the way I chose to lead my life has really led into where the music has come today, you know, and so it's been. Uh, what happens first? The song, the melody, yeah. or, the, or, the, or the, concept, <laughs> the, the music uh, oh, sound in your ear? Which comes first? For me, it's definitely the sound. I mean, I hear melodies all the time. I mean, I'm inspired by it, the simplest things, just driving, um, just getting ready for your day, you know, and you f smell the freshness of the eggs that you're cooking mm. or the, the freshness of the air when you crack the window, just life itself. And uh, I always hear melody. I always hear melody first. And then we, we can build lyrics, and it makes me want to sing when I hear a good melody. Mm -hmm. and so then I'll build lyrics based on the pattern of the melodies. Mm. Um, when and how did the idea of a gospel group come about uh, and how did you come t to the name? I would say I've always had a dream in my heart to, to be the head of a, an artist group. And in 2008 is when I assumed the worship leader position. And then 2000, by the time 2010 had come around, I had a bunch of young horses is what I call them. I mean, they ready to run young guys. They're playing instruments, some of them for the first time. They've been with me for two, two and a half years and we were just jamming and making good music and we decided let's put this on record. Let's, mm -hmm. let's begin to record, which is always a vision of mine. I just mm -hmm. wanted to be in the right timing with it. But I mean, when it came about, it was really solid, the right time. Actually, the clip that uh, was shown, I believe, was the very first recording that we did as a group. And it was, uh, that song is actually what got us noticed by Hollywood. Mm -hmm. so. Um, and, and how did you arrive at the name of, the, of your group? The name of the group, The Frontline, um, we prayed. We, we really wanted an, a name that uh, not just spoke to the church itself, but speaks to people, all people. People, when you hear the name The Frontline, you automatically, I would assume, you would think, okay, people that are ready to take the line, you know, or people that are really ready to extend the line or extend the borders of their habitation, so to speak. And so that's kind of where we come from. We've been charged to really just 
push a sound into the atmosphere and push a sound of, of, of God is here and God is coming, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that, that deep for me. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so you were around music growing mm -hmm. up. Yeah. How did you happen to actually start singing? Uh, formerly, it was the church. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I sang in high school as well, and I always sang, but I really started singing in, in high school with a group. Mm -hmm. And the, the lead singer of the group ended up splitting off, and he chose to only sing uh, Christian music at the time. And mm -hmm. at the time, I, I wasn't serving the Lord, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, later on, I ended up seeing him at the local church that I ended up going to, mm -hmm. and he was the worship leader at the time. Okay. And so we kind of got back together and began singing again. And, uh, just opened up the avenue, and so yeah. Um, thinking about uh, you know singing, getting exposed locally, uh, how did your exposure uh, nationally come about? Um, through the process of the internet. I mean, so much is available now. If you're an artist and you're in Jefferson City, Missouri, Columbia, Missouri, some smaller part of the state wherever you're living in, you don't have to be isolated anymore. I mean, you know, it used to be artists thought they actually had to move to Los Angeles, move to New York, move to Nashville, wherever the creative hub, Atlanta, um, to get the exposure that they were looking at if they wanted national attention. Well, now through the internet, I mean, you can submit and send your music to different organizations here and there. And it's usually a pretty smooth and easy process. You just have to have a, a good, strong, a uh, set of music, um, mm -hmm. good material, you know, material that you've worked on, you've really honed, that really sounds maybe like radio sounds, you know, you really got to do your homework mm -hmm. and people will uh, take notice. Mm -hmm. What was your first uh, national contact? Uh, I would say it was when um, the Hollywood Music and Media Awards uh, nominated us in 2011 for Day of Reformation. Um, and that I actually was not paying attention and they had been emailing me and finally the executive producer of the show says, hey, you're nominated, are you coming? And I'm like, oh, so I had eight days to uh, get ready. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty crazy yeah. and first time I ever experienced walking on red carpet and uh, just being in that atmosphere. I have family that lives in Los Angeles but never really had been to Hollywood mm -hmm. before. So mm -hmm. it was a pretty uh, awesome experience and actually at that particular awards program, um, Smokey Robinson was being recognized as the Lifetime Achievement recipient. And so it was really uh, good for me because that's part of my background, my father, you know, my mother playing that kind of music, really soulful music as a kid growing up. And so mm. a lot um, of respect to that. So you got your national recognition from uh, venturing into the internet. Mm -hmm. um, how do you go about deciding which venue you're going to submit your music to. Did you just blast it or how did you decide? No, it's, it's the tools are, are there for you to have, especially as an independent artist, someone who's not signed to a label. Um, the playing ground has changed. I mean, it used to be you thought you had to go and be a part of a major label. Nowadays, you can actually be an independent artist and do just as much as what the labels, the major labels, are doing for their artists. Mm -hmm. You just have to be a little bit um, kind of like a bloodhound. You got to be able to search it out, and, and that's me. I'm the guy that goes behind the scenes, and um, I'm willing to actually do the meticulous work, see where can you submit your music for recognition, where can you submit your music for an award, possibly, in a certain category, where can your music find its place uh, just through the advent of the Internet. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not that unavailable nowadays. I mean, to name a specific, you can have a Reverb Nation account, which is um, kind of a musician's platform to build a small little website yourself. And through that, there are opportunities. And so I remember submitting to some of those opportunities and getting a few looks and getting put on radio stations. And it just kind of slowly started to build. So, mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit about uh, looking at your bio. There's a number of awards uh, that oh, yeah. you've uh, uh, acquired and, and places that you've gone. Share a little bit of that with us. Oh, man. So nominated in 2011 for the Hollywood Music and Media Award. Um, we did not win that year. Um, but I say we won in certain ways because it was just a privilege and an honor to be recognized for our local music mm -hmm. on that platform. 
and it opened up the door for me to begin to shake hands mm -hmm. and meet people that are doing music on a, on a bigger scale. And from that one opportunity, um, that very first nomination, I was offered the opportunity to sing with Stevie Wonder in mm -hmm. uh, the National International Colors of Love Choir. Mm -hmm. And so that led into me wanting to do more music and, and possibly really stretch that and see, could we possibly win something like this, mm -hmm. you know? And so I came back home with a new thirst and a new drive. And in 2012, submitted my music again to the HMMA. And that year we did win for a song that I wrote called Come and See. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a gospel song. It's actually used now for a national uh, television program, uh, Diane Chamberlain, The Time Is Now. Mm -hmm. she, actually, that's my pastor. And she used it as a theme song and that plays on CTN. And so got my first television placement through that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then the next year submitted to the, Indi it's the Indie Music Channel Awards mm -hmm. and uh, received a number of awards that year for the History, which is another song from the album, and also for Come and See. Mm -hmm. um, 2014, won one more for an easy listening song that I wrote for um, actually Jim Reek of Channel 8, KOMU 8 here in Columbia, Missouri. Um, he was doing a book on Joplin and the survivors um, mm -hmm. after the tornado. And so I wrote a song to kind of coincide with the book, and the song was called Your Friend. Mm -hmm. and so it was nominated and won for the easy listening category with that award. 2015, we're moving up. Um, that was the Academia Award for a new song I released last summer um, in June called Hidden in You. And so that was a single that's been released here recently and that one won that award for the gospel category of the month of August 2015. So how did you happen so, to uh, sing with uh, Stevie Wonder? Stevie Wonder. That, uh, from the very first time when I was out there, I got the invitation from one of the gentlemen that was, that was sitting at the table with me and we just started talking and uh, people are really friendly out there, I would say. It's not like a Southern hospitality, but it's a cordialness, you know, because everyone respects everyone that's there. And I got home um, from the awards. Like I said, we didn't win. I wasn't upset about that, but I was just so thrilled about the opportunity of being there and got a phone call. And they asked if I could come back the next week. And I was like, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, I'm on my own nickel here. And they said, well, you know, we're we're having tryouts for Stevie Wonder Squire um, for his national, or for his, in, um, it's called the uh, House Full of Toys. And it was his 16th annual. And he does that every year in Los Angeles. It's a benefit concert, but it's Stevie Wonder style benefit mm -hmm. concert. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's pulling out, you know, people like Michael McDonald, Steve Harvey hosted it, Charlie Wilson, Hezekiah Walker and his group uh, from New York, um, Angela Winbush, artists that go back in time with Stevie. He also had young artists there. Justin Bieber was there. Mm -hmm. um, Drake, uh, one of the rapper guys, he was there that night. And so we're all backstage together, you know, and so it was, it was pretty awesome. I got to meet some of those people and make some contacts. And mm -hmm. so, you know, everyone respects everyone because you're doing the work. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Uh, producing music, mm -hmm. um, independent, how expensive is it to get from ground zero to where you are now? That's where the rubber meets the road because what you end up having is creative people, but then creative people that gotta be willing to back themselves up, so to speak. In other words, you gotta believe in your music more than anyone does because you are unknown, because no one's necessarily backing your talent. Um, only you know how good you want it to be and how good it could be. And from just experience, trying different producers. The chemistry between a producer and a songwriter can light up like that, or it can be just as about as melancholy as it comes, and you know, you just go through that process. But I would say, uh, believing enough in yourself to begin to save up for that process. Most producers um, are charging by the hour, maybe 25 to 45 an hour, depending on what they're doing specifically for you. If they're building a track for you, it can get more expensive, but you just got to prepare yourself for that. And then not only just the creation process, but the protection process, um, having your music copy written, going in and having uh, the royalty agencies being a part of your music, ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. Those are the three royalty reporting agencies. Mm -hmm. Having an account with Sound Exchange, which is the digital side of your royalty reporting agency. Having those little um, organizations that you, you find out you get into that and so that you're protected and so and then also coming into manufacturing your product so you want to put out an album you got costs that include um, 
photo shoot, album design cover. You got costs that'll include mass production, manufacturing, um, things that you want to go with that if you're at a show and you want to sell t-shirts or bracelets or things like that. The artist has to be willing to put that up, you know? And so that's, that's where you come, to, that's where it comes down to, are, is this really going to be a medium for forward movement? Are you looking at this as a career or is it as a hobby or you just mm -hmm. want to write a few songs or do you want this to become a really career? Or career? Mm -hmm. So, What about the promotion that. side? Promotions, there's a lot of avenues for that. I mean, we did a lot of our own self-promotion um, just through internet blasting, you know, sending out emails to the people that we've done concerts for you know you, you collect that information and that becomes your fan base mm -hmm. and whenever you're going to be at a show you send that out to that group that's there you know and they know and they'll bring their people in and so promotion can start from that level and then it can get deeper and then you can actually bring bring in people if you needed to at some point so where did the entrepreneur spirit come from ah uh, i'd say my mom and dad probably you know as a kid they both um, were very hardworking and uh, had gotten to a certain level where we were living pretty good at, at one point. And both of my parents have always, and actually they, even now they still get targeted when people talk to them, they ask them, are you in radio? They, both of them have this radio voice and mm -hmm. they, neither one of them has ever done it. My mom did some singing, background singing as a younger person, but um, definitely I'd say I get that spirit from my parents, mm -hmm. you know, and then just what's, been God birthed in me, you know, mm -hmm. to, to really go out and launch out and do uh, something for myself. Even the cosmetology is a representative of that. So, so songwriter, singer, um, what does it mean when you say that you are a songwriter, singer? What, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Most people say singer, songwriter. Okay. When, you, when you get to certain places and you see cards and people are passing around information, usually it's a card that says, singer, songwriter, Jane or John Doe. Mm -hmm. I put songwriter, singer on mine because I want more than, I want to write songs that I'm not the only singer of. Mm -hmm. You know, in the church, you've got hymnals and we all sing those right. songs. Mm -hmm. You know, um, even uh, CCLI, which is a conglomerate group that as a worship leader, I have access to, I can pay them a subscription and I can get songs that common artists that are producing and writing now, they'll post their music up, mm -hmm. they'll post the lyrics, they'll post the, all of the song notes and everything up. And um, I can have access to that and bring that into my team and we can sing those songs. And so, yeah. So just having the ability to be able to sing other people's music has driven me to want to write songs for, not just myself, but for other people, other congregations. Um, other singers, other songwriters. So. Um, so I understand that you now have a studio in your home. Yes. Um, what does that entail? That is a process. <laughs> it, it's been built over a couple of years, maybe three years, to be honest, um, just piece by piece and getting, uh, I'm not a producer at heart, you know, at heart I'm a songwriter and a singer, vocalizer, and I like vocal production and layering and stacks of vocals and just harmonizing but um, not always wanting to have to go to a producer or to go to a, a recording studio to put those things down prompted me to begin to build my own studio. And so now I can actually go into my studio, layer vocals, layer melodies, have my musicians come in, play bass tracks or play keyboard. And then I can send that to some producers that I work with and say, hey, this is our thought process. This is what we're kind of, this is the backdrop or, or pre-production and let's build from there. And so mm -hmm. it's really helping me out. It's effective cost-wise too. Mm -hmm. If you just uh, take the time to kind of learn that and being around them, most producers, most of the producers I work with are really cool people. They actually want to show you how. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that was kind of the newest thing that I've had to come into, yeah, I'd say. Okay, so have you produced other singers yet? Um, I have been a part of, on my uh, albums, I've been a part of the vocal production, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, Getting ready to wrap it up here, um, someone who has a dream, um, they thought about it, they dreamed about it, how do you, would you tell them to go from dream to reality? That's an interesting question and it's a good question because everyone I feel like has a God-given dream. 
it's been impregnated, it's been implanted, it's been knitted in them from creation, you know, from the time they were in their mother's womb. And the scripture says, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. Right. And so that's already something to draw from. And so I would say, draw on your inner, you know, draw on the thing that really drives you and, and the thing that you just can't let go of, even though you've been told no by people that are already doing it or mm -hmm. um, the establishment, or maybe you're a little different at doing whatever this new thing is. You may be a fashion designer and you're a little different with your fashion. Don't accept no so easy, you know what I mean? Really do your homework, press in. Find people that are more credible than you and get underneath that and let that begin to speak into your life and build you up into your own creative place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I found my process was just serving in the local house of God. Mm -hmm. And just by having a, a servanthood spirit, you know, just being willing to do the simplest things, just learn the song, learn the CD, get the song and the paperwork and learn it and have it ready by Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we would get together and just do that, but doing it well, doing mm -hmm. it with all your heart. And so no matter what you do or no matter where you're at in your process, never uh, despise the day of small beginnings. I mean, it could be something small that you're doing now that can launch you into a bigger and brighter future in that. And so there's always an, an ability to unlock the potential on the inside of you. My best advice would be, yes, definitely getting underneath a mentor or someone like my mentor, Dean Mitchum. He's the uh, senior worship leader down at Christian International and underneath Bishop Bill Hammond. And he literally pours into me. I talk to him once a month and he's an international psalmist. He doesn't have to do that, mm -hmm. but because he cares about reproducing that, that's what mm -hmm. he was willing to do for me. And mm -hmm. so I want to be able to do that for other people. So anyone that's willing and has a good heart and, and wants to really go there and wants to be challenged and stretched, they can look me up on my website. Maybe I'll see what I can do as far as helping out because yeah. you well, want to see that. Share your website. Uh, the website is amirsmith.com and it's A-M-E-I-R Smith. Dot com. Okay. So. Smith, uh, Amir, thank yes. you very much. Uh, thank you. It, it's, uh, it's a blessing to be able to, to one, to, to sit and talk with you um, and talk about uh, the fact that, that you understand the importance of, of, of having God in your life yeah. and then letting him lead you wherever that's going to be yeah. and not fighting that yeah. <laughs> because sometimes yeah. we do fight mm -hmm. something that the Lord has already placed out there for us to yep. do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Hey, we uh, hope that you've enjoyed our interview with uh, Mr. Amir Smith. Uh, check him out on his website. Great music. Uh, we hope that you will take the time to uh, to check him out and uh, uh, great sound, different sound. Uh, yeah. Take the time to check it out. We have been talking with Mr. Amir Smith. He's a songwriter, producer, and we'll see you next time. God bless. Fill us with your vision, Lord.